views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Welcome to Bronx Talk. On June 22nd, Democrats across the city will vote to select their party's candidates in the primary for city offices. Tonight, in conjunction with the Bronx Democratic County Committee, we present the Bronx Controllers Forum to give candidates a chance to talk about how they plan to use the office of the city controller to improve things in our borough of the Bronx. We'll meet the candidates and get the guidelines for tonight's forum in a moment, but let's first introduce the chair of the Bronx Democratic County Committee, Senator Jamal Bailey. Senator well, Bailey. Thank you, Gary, and thank you, BronxNet, and thank you, Controller Candidates, for coming to the Boogie Down Bronx tonight. Good evening, Bronxites. Um, this is going to be an incredible election. We have a mayoral election. We have a number of city council candidates in our borough, but we also have a city controller, which is the city's chief financial officer, who's going to be tasked with something major, bringing New York City and the Boogie Down Bronx back from the worst economic crisis that we've had in quite some time. Uh, these candidates were, are going to speak to you. They're going to tell you what their vision for the Bronx is. They're going to tell you how they're going to help us get out of the borough. But most importantly, my hope is that they're going to each, each of them is going to tell you how they're going to be the controller for all of us in the borough of the Bronx. So I'm excited to hear from all of them. But most importantly, I'm excited for you to go out and vote for someone. So on June 22nd, no matter who it is, make sure you get out there and exercise your right to vote. Gary, thank you once again. And to all the controller candidates, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator. Uh, we appreciate your support of the program and of voter literacy in the Bronx. Viewers, please note that on tonight's program, uh, the candidates who reached out to the Bronx Democratic County Committee for support were then selected for participation in tonight's program. Also, tonight's questions have been approved by the Bronx Democratic County Committee. So now let's uh, meet the candidates. Uh, the current state senator representing Harlem, East Harlem and the Upper West Side, it is Brian Benjamin, Mr. Benjamin, nice to have you with us, sir. Thanks for being. Thanks for having me. A, a former um, financial journalist for CNBC and was a candidate in last year's 14th congressional district primary, Michelle Caruso Cabrera. She will join us in a moment. Um, also, a, a former Marine who has worked on veteran issues throughout his nonprofit, Headstrong, Zachary Iscall. Mr. Iscall, Great nice to, to have you with thanks us. Thanks for having me, Gary. The city council member representing Carroll Gardens, Park Slope, and Kensington in Brooklyn. It is Brian Lander. Mr. Lander, thanks for joining us. Thanks so much, Gary. Brad Lander, but thank Brad you. Brad Lander, I'm sorry. All good. Thank you. I, I, I guess my reading is not what it used to be. Uh, so it is Brad Lander, and thank you. Uh, that's this, the Bronx, you know, sometimes. That's it. Uh, make sure you don't mistake that. Uh, the state senator representing a district that includes Flatbush, Ditmas, and uh, Park Slope. Also in Brooklyn, it is uh, Kevin Parker. Mr. Parker, nice to have you with us. Yes, Eric, thanks for having us. Oh, sorry. <laughs> thanks for having us. <laughs> <laughs> Call me what you'd like. It's totally fine. Uh, the State Assembly member representing Northeast Queens, it is David Weperin. Nice to have you with us. Great to be here, Gary. Thank you. Uh, candidates, as you know, many people in the Bronx have historically felt underserved when it comes to a variety of city services. The inequality has shown itself time and again in income, housing, health care, and in receiving equitable shares of city services in general. So tonight we'll give you a chance to discuss how, if you are the city's controller, how can the city's resources be reapplied to address some of those issues in uh, the Bronx? Each candidate will have one minute each to answer each question. Uh, we'll give you time warnings at 30 and 15, uh, just so that uh, you know exactly how we're doing. By prior agreement, uh, the first question will go to Kevin Parker. So uh, Mr. Parker, let's get started with uh, financial inequity. In the Bronx, the tale of two cities is real. The numbers don't lie. The Bronx is the poorest borough 
in the city with a median household income below $40,000 and a poverty rate of a very difficult 26.2%. Of course, this has numerous implications on many aspects of life in the city's northernmost borough. What are the issues that hold Bronx people back financially? And if you are a controller, how would you address them? Yeah, the inequities that we see in the Bronx uh, is similar to Brooklyn where I've grown up. Um, and like many of you, um, I grew up in public housing. I grew up in the Bushwick projects. I went to public school my entire life. Um, and I have seen the kind of inequity um, that, that Brooklyn and, and the Bronx both share. Uh, and so, you know, we have to begin as we move out of this pandemic that has affected both our lives and our livelihoods of having a rebuild that is an equitable rebuild. Um, that's why I've talked about creating a count, an economic equity council. Um, that's going to bring together business leaders and labor leaders, community leaders and clergy leaders to help, to help um, map a, a way forward. Um, we will you know, work on getting jobs because we know that Bronxites want a hand up, not a hand out. And we'll build small businesses on the main street of the Bronx um, all over um, that we know will create full-time jobs at a living wage with benefit. That's, it, that's the way that we're going to rebuild our economy. Thank you very much. And uh, the same question then for uh, Mr. Weprin. Uh, thank you, Gary. Uh, I announced uh, early on in this campaign uh, that I plan on opening up uh, uh, four other borough offices uh, outside of Manhattan. Uh, I'll, I'll start with the Bronx, uh, alphabetical, uh, alphabetically, it's uh, very important. We, we're a five borough city. Uh, we should be a five borough controller office. And I'm gonna use those um, regional offices uh, to focus um, on underserved communities uh, and financial services. Uh, one of my previous jobs was uh, I was chair of a subcommittee of the banking committee uh, for uh, banking financial services in underserved communities. Uh, and the Bronx is probably at the top of the list of underserved communities for financial services. So we will focus in that Bronx office uh, on that, as well as financial literacy uh, and, and helping small businesses uh, recover uh, in that Bronx office. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lander. Same question. Thank you, Gary, so much for the invitation to the virtual Bronx to have this conversation. I really appreciate it. Look, well before the COVID crisis, as folks in the Bronx know, our city was already riven by racial and economic inequality, and the pandemic has made it so much worse. Seventy percent of people who have lost their jobs are people of color, especially in sectors like retail and hospitality. So part of what we have to do as we fight for a just recovery is to make sure it's more equal. So I was just up with the workers at the Hunts Point Market, Local 202, I'm proud to say, is supporting 30%. me. They demanded more dignity and better pay in their essential work. Um, I've helped fight to make sure that fast food workers have a fair work week, have $15 minimum wage, have paid sick leave, have workplace protections, to get Uber and Lyft drivers a living wage rate of pay, 15. the first city in the country to do it. We can fight and win a just recovery that invests in our infrastructure, in our small business, and especially in making sure we rebuild a more equal economy for the workers of the Bronx and for the whole city. Thank you very much. Uh, Brian Benjamin, this is um, uh, your chance to talk about financial inequity in the Bronx. Thank you, Gary, for this uh, forum. And I just want to thank my, my, my colleagues for being here as well. A couple points. One is the comptroller has $240 billion pension fund. A, a piece of that is, is supposed to be focused on economically targeted investments that specifically do things like this, which is invest in local communities, particularly ones that have been underrepresented in and underinvested in for way too long. And we need to invest in some of the small businesses in, in the Bronx and help them grow, help them hire individuals. And then also we need to make sure that the contracts um, that a city of New York is giving out that more businesses in the Bronx are getting them and that when they get them, they're able to uh, pay people on time. And that's something that I've been talking a lot about. And I think if we can if we can focus on those two things, it'll really help to, to, to move, the, move the, uh, the scale a little bit and also workforce development. We need to make sure that as we're preparing for the jobs of the future, infrastructure, et cetera, that communities like the Bronx have, the have people with talent get the, the right skills so that they can uh, take advantage of that opportunity. Thank you very much. And uh, so the uh, final response on this question will go to Mr. Iskall. Gary, thanks for having me. It's great to be up here virtually in the Bronx, at least. Uh, hope we can do this in the near future in person in the Bronx. One of my favorite memories from childhood was uh, walking into Yankee Stadium for the first time with my father and seeing Don Mattingly uh, and hearing the stories about my dad growing up in Queens uh, and seeing a live baseball game in color for the first time. 
You know, I think there's a couple things that I'd say in terms of addressing the financial uh, inequities that are most apparent up in the Bronx. Um, number one is it's the reason, one of the reasons I'm running for comptroller. And when you think about the comptroller's role, traditionally you think about it in terms of, uh, you know, the fiduciary responsibilities of the oversight of city agencies. Um, one of the reasons I'm running is I think the office can be used to lead to greater economic development in communities like the Bronx, ensuring that there are jobs. This is something that I've done before in my career. I've helped tens of thousands of people transition into new careers through workforce development, through matching them to job, pro job programs. And I think one of the things that we need to make sure that we're doing as we are leading the New York City's recovery is making sure that those dollars that we are spending are being spent in the places where they're most needed. Thank you very much. For our next question, let's talk about healthcare. With Bronx epidemics and asthma, diabetes, drug addiction, and obesity, it was likely that once the pandemic hit, the borough would see some gruesome numbers. Tragically, that did play out in infections, hospitalizations, and ultimately, unfortunately, in COVID deaths. But the irony couldn't be more stark. This is in a borough that's largest industry is healthcare. And we have some of the city's best hospitals in the Bronx. Yet health disparities rage. How should the next controller address this? Okay, uh, thank you, Gary. Uh, obviously, um, health has become even more important uh, during this pandemic, and we must make sure that uh, all the healthcare facilities uh, get the proper funding. Uh, there's, uh, we're dealing now with the state budget, and the city will be right behind with the city budget. Uh, we're fighting to restore uh, all these uh, healthcare cuts uh, that are proposed. Uh, I've been uh, on the front and center along with uh, uh, Dick Gottfried, who chairs the health committee in our house, uh, who has endorsed my candidacy for controller. Uh, we really have to uh, prioritize uh, healthcare. Uh, and particularly now we have to make sure uh, that everybody uh, gets the vaccine and it gets rolled out much quicker uh, and that it's rolled out fairly, uh, that we have uh, equity uh, in, in distributing the vaccine. Uh, and, and that should be a priority uh, from the federal government on down. But uh, certainly we have to make sure that, uh, that we maintain uh, our healthcare facilities and, and services uh, during the pandemic uh, and, and beyond. Thank you very much, Mr. Lander. Let's uh, talk about healthcare. Absolutely. It was ex been excruciatingly cruel to watch each new map come out, whether it's where the COVID rates are, whether it's where the vaccine is being distributed, and see that it is low-income communities, communities of color, and quite often the Bronx that have not gotten the level of resources necessary through this pandemic. One thing the controller can do out of our audit bureau is do more equity audits that are looking not just at the financial health of institutions like health and hospitals, but at you know, what the equitable and seconds. inequitable outcomes are. And I'll set up an equity auditing bureau and look at healthcare. I am proud to be part of a city council that has invested in h, &H. Um, New York Health and Hospitals has been critical in this pandemic. So many cities through austerity politics have closed their public hospitals. We still have 11, we have to invest in them more strongly. And finally, the controller's got an important role to play on environmental health. I was proud to work with my colleagues, Antonio Reynoso, changing our commercial waste system, passing the Climate Modernization Act to reduce pollution from our buildings, environmental Time. health is a critical issue in the Bronx. We've got to fight the environmental racism that we have seen too often. Thank you very much. Uh, healthcare is uh, to you, Mr. Benjamin. Yeah, thank you for this question. It's so important because one of the things that we've seen and we're still seeing right now, the rates in the Bronx on, on COVID are higher than the rest of the city. And I think there's a couple of things that we need to deal with. One is we do need to, uh, we do need to look at an audit of HHC and really kind of get a sense of how, the, how we are investing uh, across our hospitals. One of the things that I think is important to note is that there are some um, ethnic and racial cultural issues that need to be addressed um, as it relates to how uh, uh, being de determined, you know, maternal, maternal uh, uh, fatalities with, with um, uh, as it relates to African-American communities are much, are higher, even amongst those who have more money. And so I think one of the things that we have to uh, look very closely at is, you know, 15. how are we investing in that regards? And also look at uh, safe staffing. We don't have enough nurses in our, in our communities who are culturally sensitive to those neighborhoods. I've been fighting for those issues in the Senate and I look to do so in the, as a comptroller. Thank you very much, Mr. Isco. Um, healthcare, the very important topic for the Bronx and really everybody in New York City. Yeah, thanks for asking this question. This is something that I've spent a lot of time working in. I've actually delivered healthcare to a lot of people. 
I did it when I got out of the Marine Corps building one of the leading largest providers of mental health care for veterans in the U.S. I did it most recently as a deputy director at Javits Medical Center, leading the turnaround of Javits Medical Center from empty beds to being one of the only successful COVID field hospitals in the country. And I think one of the things that we really need to think about, and this is a true across the city, is the issues we are facing are deeply interconnected and they can only be addressed uh, through a holistic approach. I'll give a couple examples of that in the probably 45 sec, 30 seconds that I have remaining. Um, Walking around the halls of Javits Medical Center, spending time with our patients. Um, We weren't just treating people for COVID. Uh, We were treating them for poverty. Uh, You know, there's a whiteboard behind everybody's bed. And on that whiteboard, you see things like diabetes, asthma, hypertension, many of the things that you asked about when you announced this. We've got to start addressing these things early on, even mental health care for veterans. You know, it's not just combat trauma. A lot of the veterans we treat for suicidality have adverse childhood experiences. And so this is not just about treating people at the moment of combustion or once it becomes a health care crisis. It's about doing everything we can to prevent these crises from occurring in the first place. Thank you very much. To you, Mr. Parker, let's talk about uh, health care. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and my colleagues have waxed poetic about this uh, about this subject. You know, um, you know everything has been said. Everybody hasn't said it, right? And at the end of the day, um, what they have done is talked about healthcare. I'm the only one who's actually passed legislation on this. In fact, I passed a bill that made the Office of Health Disparities in the Department of Health actually look at the health disparities of COVID-19 amongst African Americans and Latinos. The the safe staffing bill that I'm glad that Brian Benjamin is talking about is my bill. I actually am the first person to sponsor a bill um, on the issue of safe staffing, and so I agree. And when when you hear Zach Iskell talk about the issue of the social determinants of of health, that is exactly right. But the way that you do that is that you gotta create a a, a proper economic underpinning. And that's why creating full-time jobs at a living wage with benefits is at the heart of my plan because until you create jobs and then give people access to the insurance that they need and the kind of income that they need, then they can improve those issues that, that create healthcare deserts, that create um, poor housing, that deal with the, the kind of violence that we see in our community, and the issue of racism, which I've also have a bill that makes the Department of Health look at racism as a health issue and a health crisis in our state. These are important Thank issues, you. and we got to work on it. Thank you very much. All right, now let's talk to uh, Mr. Lander about uh, housing. Uh, let's talk about NYCHA. There was a recent story in the news about Bronx River houses being without heat for three months. Obviously, an absolutely unacceptable situation. And that's only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to NYCHA issues. First of all, uh, do you favor privatization of some of NYCHA's property? That has come up. Also, secondly, is there more that can be done at NYCHA other than just simply waiting for a federal funding package? So I'm wholeheartedly opposed to privatization. We can keep NYCHA fully public and invest what's necessary in it to make it uh, safe and decent and affordable, an opportunity for families and for kids to grow up that we all want for our families and for our kids. So um, I oppose privatization. We're not waiting around for federal funding. We're fighting hard for federal funding. My Congresswoman, Nidia Velasquez, they don't call her La La Luchadora for nothing. She is fighting hard to make sure that the Biden package includes the billions of dollars that we deserve. You know, New York City sends more money to Washington than we get back, and we are going to make sure we invest it. Now, there are other things that we are doing um, in the council that the state can be doing. I'm working uh, in Gowanus to make sure we get investments in our public housing here. I've also uh, put forward a bold new plan for social housing, things like Mitchell Lama, limited equity cooperatives, community land trusts, um, and nonprofit owned housing, like was born on Banana on Kelly Street by Banana Kelly. The treating housing as a public good is how we are going to solve our affordable housing crisis, not by treating right. it as something that's private and for profit. Thank you very much. So, uh, Mr. Benjamin, same question for you: the troubling question of NYCHA, what to do with it? Sure, I, I actually I agree with with a number of things that Brad had mentioned. I think that uh, NYCHA should stay in public hands. I think that, uh, and I, we've been speaking to NYCHA. Uh, I just was speaking to the chairman yesterday about a about a public housing preservation trust that they're looking at that can create a new dynamic that will allow some some vouchers to come in from the federal government that can help bring at least three to four billion dollars of extra capital to to NYCHA. I mean, NYCHA right now has a forty billion dollar capital need. It is immense, and it has been um, under it's been starved by the federal government for too long, and it hasn't had the great, the best management. And so we, we do need to do something different, but I don't think that it has to be private. I think there are there are ways for uh, NYCHA, and, and I, I actually commend some of the some of the innovative ideas that that um, 
Greg West is ha- coming up with. But we do need to be very careful to, to, that if we don't uh, have a comprehensive plan, uh, we will constantly have this drip, drip, drip situation where every year there's more capital needs and we never get ahead of the situation. We need $40 billion. We need to do it now. Federal government put in an infrastructure. We need an infrastructure plan to include NYCHA as, uh, as part of infrastructure. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Iskall. I agree with a lot of what Senator Benjamin just said. I think the uh, the Preservation Trust and uh, the NYCHA plan, it's the best thing that I've seen for actually solving this problem. Um, I do think, though, that we need to look at contingency plans. Um, you know, we talk often about the federal government is going to bail us out here. The federal government is going to solve this. The federal government is going to solve that. Um, we need to have contingencies because this is a crisis that gets worse and worse by the day. Um, and it's something that we've got to step in and figure out ways of solving that. And I think the Preservation Trust is one of the best things that I've seen for actually helping to do that. I think also citywide, uh, there's a lot of things that we need to be doing to changing the way that we look at uh, housing in this city. 15 Starting years. with, um, you know, a lot of the work I've done in my life is bringing together groups that were diametrically opposed. In Iraq, I was leading uh, hundreds of Iraqi soldiers. Many of them had physical scars that others had caused them uh, in previous engagements. And the way that you get people to work together is you have to have a common objective and goal. And I think with housing, that starts with understanding what our goal is for the city with vacancy rates and um, and how much housing we need at different affordability levels. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Parker, the troubling situation at NYCHA. Yeah, thank you. Gary, you know, I'm uniquely qualified to deal with this because I'm the only candidate in this race who actually was born and raised in NYCHA. Again, growing up in the Bushwick Projects, uh, 390 Bushwick Avenue, apartment 6D, I, you know, have been stuck on the elevator and had to run up in the dark where there's no lights uh, in, in the hallway and the, and the urine in, in, in the elevators and, you know, and, and the kind of things that happen, the violence and, and the kind of um, segregation that happens in NYCHA is a real deal. And, 30 seconds. You know, you hear people talk about the numbers. You're right. They have been started by the federal government. We have to do better. We have to really make sure that there's there's resources um, that come in. Privatization is not the answer. Um, we definitely have to continue to make NYCHA fully public, but we have to get the resources seconds. to, in fact, continue to build it. But more importantly, we have to build help build the people who live in NYCHA. We have to help them um, get job training, workforce development. We have to get them entrepreneurial training, get them access to capital, get them the kind of mentorship they need to swap their own small businesses and have their own opportunity to be part of the American dream. Too big to fail. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Weprin, you'll get the uh, final word on this question. Uh, Thank you, Gary. Uh, No question. Uh, I agree with uh, my colleagues uh, that uh, we should not privatize uh, NYCHA, but there's a lot of improvement uh, that can be made. Uh, We in the uh, Assembly and Senate uh, have um, have focused on uh, capital projects uh, for NYCHA. Uh, that's been uh, a major uh, goal of uh, Speaker Carl Hasty from the Bronx, uh, has been pushing to uh, get additional capital uh, since I'm in the assembly uh, for, for NYCHA. We definitely uh, have been shortchanged by the federal government for many years, as uh, was pointed out, Senator uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan used to always talk about the billions more that uh, we send to uh, the federal government in taxes uh, versus how much we get back in services. Uh, NYCHA is certainly uh, front and center on that. Uh, and I would use the audit function as controller uh, to uh, be a laser focus uh, on NYCHA to try to uh, improve efficiency uh, and try to uh, provide uh, better services uh, for residents of NYCHA. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, the next question, uh, we'll get right to the core. Let's talk about unemployment. Uh, the Bronx had been doing considerably better with unemployment. It was down to 4.4% a year ago. Unfortunately, then the pandemic hit and everything changed. And we are at more than 15% unemployed in the Bronx right now. It was as high as 16% last month. So what can be done to energize the labor market for Bronx sites? And uh, that is to you, Mr. Benjamin. Yeah, two things. One is I really want to talk about the labor movement. Uh, you know, there are a number of, of, of labor jobs that we want to continue to grow. Uh, right now, uh, we have just passed prevailing uh, wage public works in, the, in, the, in New York State. And I think that that can create real opportunities because of, of building of affordable housing and building of, of, of new uh, uh, opportunities is, is available. And I think that economic development 
being charged in a way where we're bringing in uh, uh, people who are making good, decent uh, wages. That's a big part of it. And then there's some real opportunities to do that in, in the Bronx. And then I also just want to come back down to workforce development again. I think, you know, we, we have to make sure that as we are sort of trying to rebuild our economy, restart our economy, get our restaurants going again, uh, building out uh, all, all, of, all of what's possible for ourselves, that we make sure that no one gets left behind. And, and unfortunately, we're not sort of educating, you know, the next generation for the opportunities of the future. And I think we have to look at workforce development in a very uh, innovative way. We have to think about uh, tech, right. tech, tech, yeah, tech investments, et cetera. And that's what I think we need to do. Thank you very much. Uh, so, um, Mr. Iskol, uh, to you, let's talk about yeah, thank um, you. the labor market. Um, absolutely. As somebody who's actually helped tens of thousands of people transition into new careers, I know something about uh, the labor market and how to get people back to work. Number one is we've got to open up the economy. Um, two is as we do, we've got to make it easier for businesses to operate. We've got to look at ways of, of reducing uh, regulations and red tape that are inhibiting businesses. We've got to make people feel safe. Right. We got to make the, our community safe if people are going to go back to work uh, from whatever the source. Uh, and most importantly, you know, I'm glad that Senator Benjamin brought up workforce development. Uh, you know, a lot of people look at Thrive New York City as a scandal. I think the amount of money this town spends on workforce development, six hundred and fifty million dollars a year. And yet they do not involve the private sector at all in determining where those people are going to get jobs. So a lot of folks going to the city's workforce uh, training program are getting jobs in fast food restaurants. They're not getting new economy jobs. They're not getting the training they need for 21st century jobs. Um, that's something that needs to change. Uh, how much more time do I have? Is that- uh, No, that was it for this time. question. All right. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Um, um, we just got to make sure to fit everybody in. That's why it's arranged that I way. I get it. I get it. All right. Thank you very I'm much. I'm passionate about workforce development, but uh, yeah. We could appreciate that. Uh, let's go to uh, Mr. Parker and uh, talk about uh, building uh, jobs for Bronxites. Absolutely. The whole way, Gary, that we're going to move out of this pandemic that has been threatening both our lives and our livelihoods is that in an economy that has moved from Wall Street to Main Street, we need to pull, full, create full-time jobs at a living wage with benefits by building small businesses. And so we have to build businesses and at the same time, Trains, train people, but there are many jobs that they don't need training for. And there's many jobs out there that, that we already have had um, opportunities for. Right now, in this moment, even before the pandemic, we had uh, not enough teachers. There's gonna be more teachers leaving. We didn't have enough nurses. We see now how critical our frontline workers are. We need more people working in hospitals, working in healthcare, and these are all places in which we can provide workforce um, entry, entry level jobs um, for people to go into seconds. right this minute. And so this is not hard. This is just, it's, it's, there's nothing to it really but to do it. And I'm committed to that. I'm committed to working with CUNY to make sure that we open up pipe, pipelines to do that actual training uh, and not just for jobs, but also Time. for entrepreneurship because the best job is the job that you can create for yourself. Mr. Weprin is next. Yeah, I'm going to get back to my uh, Bronx regional office and we're going to be using that uh, in addition to uh, underserved communities and financial services we're gonna to look to uh, help small businesses, particularly in the Bronx in that office. Uh, and we will focus uh, on, uh, on creating new jobs, uh, helping small businesses uh, with existing jobs and expanding. Uh, and that certainly uh, will be a focus to help reduce unemployment in the Bronx. Uh, obviously uh, right now- 30 it's, seconds. It's, so I will make it a focus of that Bronx office to help small businesses, uh, to help uh, bring back the economy uh, in the Bronx uh, and to uh, deal with unemployment. Thank you very much. Uh, let's talk to uh, Mr. Lander uh, about uh, uh, unemployment and uh, helping improve those numbers. Thank you. So first, I think we have something in Brooklyn that I'd love to help bring to the Bronx and that's the model of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Uh, the Navy Yard is a mission-driven industrial park that is home to 450 businesses. It employs 11,000 people, two and a half billion dollars a year in economic activity. It's extraordinary what goes on in there, new technologies, um, innovative fashion. Uh, they manufactured PPE in the pandemic. So you got all kinds of small businesses owned by New Yorkers. They've just opened a couple of years ago uh, a high school where eight other high schools in the borough uh, send kids there their junior and senior years 
hands-on in all kinds of technologies that they're going to use to get jobs in the Navy Yard. It is a fantastic model. It's the kind of public infrastructure that creates a platform for shared growth. We want to see more of that in the Bronx. And finally, we can uh, raise the floor for existing jobs. Uh, As I mentioned before, when I got to the council, fast food jobs paid a minimum wage, no sick leave, no stable schedule. Through legislation, we've changed those things in the last decade. Thank you very much. Uh, we are up to uh, the next question, and that will go to uh, Zach Iskall to start. A, a, a similar question. Let's talk about small businesses. The minimum wage in the state will hit $15 an hour in July, but small business owners say that puts an extra burden on them. They also complain about being taxed and regulated, in some cases right out of existence. If you're a controller, what do you say to small business owners who have been devastated by the pandemic and are simply struggling to stay alive? Also, please talk about how you see the health of Bronx shopping districts in places like Fordham, neighborhoods like Burnside, Wakefield, and Soundview as well. I'm, I'm going to call time out for a second, Gary. You can't ask a question that takes longer than a minute to ask, so <laughs> ask a question and just give us a minute to respond. But uh, I'll do it's, my best with that These one. are These <laughs> are tough questions, let's be honest. Yeah. So first off, I don't hear that from a lot of small business owners that I speak to uh, about the $15 minimum wage. And I think one of the things that we have to look at is you know, if we are, uh, if people are not earning a fair wage, those costs are being accrued and paid for elsewhere, right? Often through the public, uh, through the public. Um, in terms of small businesses, we have to, you know, I'm glad you brought this up. Businesses were struggling before COVID. They were operating on razor thin margins before COVID. I think I might be the only one in the field that's actually built a business um, and operated a business. I've built a number of businesses. Um, And uh, one of the things is um, when you talk to business owners around the city is the amount of red tape and regulation. There's something like 6,000 different rules and regulations in the city that they need to apply to. There's 17 or 16 different agencies that they need to navigate. We need to cut a lot of this red tape and make it simpler. I think also one of the things that needs to happen now with the sales tax, turning sales tax into grants that, that businesses, small businesses, restaurants can keep in their pocket because we know there's two things that businesses operate on costs and revenues. And if we can increase revenues with sales tax grants and reduce costs, um, that will really help them. Uh, We do appreciate that. Uh, Let's go to uh, Mr. Parker and uh, talk about our small businesses. What's the question again? No, I'm just joking. Look, (laughs) the reality is that small businesses are our way out of this pandemic and this pandemic economy, right? And again, how we're going to do it. We need to, in fact, provide the things that we know small businesses need. In our communities, we have people who know how to cook food, don't know how to run a restaurant. People who could build a table, don't know how to run a restaurant, um, don't know how to you know, kind of run the business. And, and so we got to provide them the technical assistance. And we also have to provide them access to capital and bonding, as well as mentorship. I've done that in my district as a state senator, um, working with, with um, Brooklyn College, which is in my district, and, and, and the SBA. We need to do that around the city. And as your city controller, I will create that partnership in campuses like Hostos and Boniqua College to make sure that we have small business development centers that people can walk into and seconds. see their entrepreneurial dreams come to life by getting that access to capital, getting that, that mentorship, and getting that, um, that technical assistance they need in order to have their dreams come true. And that's the way, not only are we going to build small businesses, but more importantly, get Sorry. people back to work because most of the people in our communities work in small businesses. Thank you very much. All right, then we move around the corner to uh, David Weperin. Mr. Weperin. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Early on during this pandemic, uh, I was fighting uh, for restaurant equity. Uh, Clearly, we were in a pandemic and we had to do things safely. But it was absurd uh, that my district borders on Nassau County uh, and Nassau County was able to open up restaurants before safely while uh, Queens were not allowed to. Uh, And then Nassau County went to 50 percent and Queens uh, stayed at 25 percent, went to 25 percent. I've been fighting for equity. Westchester, borders on Bronx County. Uh, There were restaurants over the border in Westchester that were uh, allowed to operate safely uh, while Bronx was not. Uh, That is not fair. We have to bring back uh, the restaurant industry, small businesses, uh, and I will use that Bronx office once again uh, to help uh, small businesses uh, and to help with uh, access to capital uh, and to aiding uh, small businesses get, get what they need. Thank you very much. Uh, Let us go to uh, Mr. Lander. When I talk to small businesses, the biggest thing that I hear them complain about is the high cost of commercial rent, 
which has gone up by 50% on average over the last decade. And unfortunately, many of our landlords have not provided any rent credit or rent break or rent relief during the COVID crisis. So those businesses were closed, they couldn't earn revenue, but they still have to pay the rent. The eviction moratorium means they're not getting thrown out yet, but they still owe it. So I've proposed a small business recovery lease program. There's authorizing legislation sponsored by Senator Kavanaugh 30. and Assembly Member uh, Yulene New. I hope, so I hope my colleagues will get that passed so we can create a program that would be a 10-year property tax break for those owners who work with their small business tenants to renegotiate an affordable lease, settle past arrears, 15. and let them thrive for the next 10 years. I think we need commercial rent control more broadly going forward so our small businesses can have the stability that they need uh, to invest when they put their blood, sweat, tears, and savings in a small business. We don't want them to have the rent doubled three years later and get thrown out and they can't make it. So let's help them recover. Let's help them thrive. Thank you very much. Uh, You'll get the final word on this question, Mr. Benjamin. Thank you. A number of our businesses, small businesses in the Bronx are minority and women-owned businesses. And unfortunately, right now in the city of New York, less than 5% of the city contracts are going to uh, minority and women-owned businesses. So one of the things that the comptroller does right now is that he has a report card. But I think we need to take that report card and, and turn that into some ideas around how we look at RFPs and how we create op- more opportunities for our small businesses uh, to get more contracts. There's billions of dollars on the table. We need to make sure they get them. And then when, when they get them, we need to make sure that they can get paid on time. And I think, unfortunately, you know, once a contract is awarded to a small business, getting people their, their pay so that they can, you know, uh, uh, pay their employees is a very, a very, a very troubling process in the city of New York. And so we need to have a, 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 a uh, expedited process between 15. the city of New York and the comptroller's office to really get awarded contracts um, uh, and, and uh, get those money into people's hands, get them registered in people's hands as soon as possible. We do that, we can really um, uh, change, the, change the map in the Bronx. All right. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. This question uh, will go back to um, Mr. Parker. And uh, let's talk about uh, the funding of the NYPD. According to the City Budget Commission, the operating budget for police is at $5.6 billion. What is your vision on crime fighting budgets in relation to other less direct initiatives that can help lower crime like community centers, social services, et cetera? Yeah, one of the first things I would do as city controller is actually audit the New York City Police Department. It's something I've been talking about um, since John Liu was the, the, the city controller. Um, it's really important that we kind of both understand how dollars are being managed, but more importantly, understand where dollars can go. You know what? Last year, a billion dollars was cut out of the New York City um, Police Department. And not one person could tell me where one of those dollars went that made it better for people in the city of New York. We need a police department that serves and protects, but does it with dignity and respect. I've been the leader on police reform in the state. Um, the state of New York was the first state in the entire country to pass a comprehensive package seconds. of police reforms after the murder of George Floyd. Of those 10 bills that we passed, um, four of those bills were mine, including the 911 uh, reporting bill um, and a bill that provides um, police cameras, uh, sorry, um, body cameras for state police. Um, we need to do more. And once we we kind of audit the police department. We then know where money is to do things like a non-police response to mental health and homeless calls, 15, a bill I have, um, and do things um, like a NYPD residency program. Again, another bill that I have. And it's those kind of legislative ideas um, that we need to implement here on the city level that Sorry. I want to bring as the city controller. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Weprin. Yes, um, I, I am not. Uh, I supported all the police reforms in Albany. I, I voted for all the bills. I, I sponsored uh, many of them, uh, co prime sponsor of many of them. Uh, but I don't think um, reducing uh, police headcount significantly, uh, and I certainly do not support defund the police movement or defunding the police because we've already seen a spike uh, in gun violence, uh, particularly in uh, black and brown neighborhoods. Uh, and that's because of the uh, perception that, uh, you know, uh, police uh, or, or police often feel that uh, not able uh, to, to do their job and, and a reduced headcount, reducing those police classes, I think was a mistake. Uh, I think we need 15 seconds. better police, but we need more police. Uh, and certainly the answer is not to uh, reduce police headcount. We need more community policing. We need more uh, relations. We need Yes, we do need sensitivity training and working closely with the community. Uh, but the answer is not uh, to reduce police headcount. 
uh, because that has already resulted uh, in a spike in, uh, in gun thank violence. You. All right, thank you very much. So Mr. Lander is uh, the next candidate. Thank you. At the height of the stop and frisk crisis, I teamed up with then council member, now public advocate, Jamani Williams to pass the Community Safety Act, to strengthen our prohibition on bias-based profiling, to create the NYPD Inspector General's office so we could end discriminatory stop and frisk. And I have continued to fight for police reform. I voted no on last year's city council budget uh, because it did not cut the NYPD by a billion dollars. There was essentially a phony budget put forward that pretended to make cuts, but didn't. I called it out at the time. We had a hiring freeze on teachers, but not on police officers. And today in the council hearing, we learned that the administration is considering hiring 475 new NYPD school safety agents at a cost of $20 million. When our middle and high schools are closed, let's take that $20 million and spend it on seconds. guidance counselors, on school social workers, on the academic and supports, on the social and emotional learning that our kids need. That's a model for how instead of spending on over-policing our young people, we could spend it on helping the Ta kids of the Bronx to thrive. Thank you very much. Uh, the next uh, uh, candidate who will talk about police budgets is uh, Mr. Benjamin. Thank you very much. I mean, I, 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 one minute on this topic, it's just, it's brutal. But anyway, I'll do my best. First, <laughs> let me say, I agree with Kevin and Charlie. We need to audit the NYPD. I think we need to talk about uh, public safety. We need to audit the NYPD and look at how every dollar is being spent and it, and what that means for our public safety. Are those all, all those programs necessary? Are they making us safe or are they making us not safe? I think one of the things that I want to push back on, on David about was, uh, you know, part of the assumption that people tend, tend to have is more police just automatically means more public safety. Very and that's nice. actually not the case. Uh, you know, the question is, what policing looks like, what should it look like? And we should be investing some of that money in things like uh, our violence interrupters. I, I was very active with them in the summer, um, uh, uh, looking at social distancing. There are a number of things that the police are doing right now that they probably shouldn't, but that should be part of a comprehensive conversation that is not just, oh, someone got shot, more police. No, no, someone got shot. Why did they get sh shot? And, and how do we look at keeping everyone safe in, in a thorough and a comprehensive way? That's how I think we should address it. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Iskall, uh, you get to talk about uh, police budgets. Great, thank you. So a couple things. Um, one is, as I've mentioned before, you know, we know that the problems facing this city are deeply interconnected and they require holistic solutions. And um, crime and public safety is one of those things that requires massive comprehensive solutions. I'm, I think the only one in the field that's actually built military units, made life and death decisions. I've done that around the world. I helped build the first Marine Special Operations Unit in terms of creating a better police force, I know how to do that. I know how to do it in terms of the people we're selecting, the type of training we're doing, who we're promoting through the ranks, how we're interacting with the public, what type of community groups we're partnering with, like Violence Interrupters that have had a lot of great success out in Brownsville and East New York and Howard House and Langston Hughes, where I think they've now gone 110 days without a shooting. Last thing I'll say though is, you know, about this, I spend Monday night over at Penn Station, which has become a de facto homeless shelter. Um, there are hundreds of homeless people sleeping in Penn Station and Monday night was a warm night. The only people I saw there were four or five or six cops and they were doing everything they could to care for people. The people I was speaking to as somebody who is intimately Time. familiar with mental health, had major mental health issues. Where are all these other people that, that, that we're talking about that are supposed to be on the ground helping these homeless people that need our help so that we don't have other situations occurring like this guy on the subway over the weekend? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, go to our uh, final question here. And um, uh, let's talk about um, another budgetary priority. Uh, let's talk about um, uh, culture budgets. Last year, the city decimated culture budgets by 60%. The full expenditure on these programs is a paltry $6 million for the entire city. Yet there is extensive data that programs like music and art keep children in school, keep them engaged and focused, and also improve their SAT scores. It also lowers crime, especially youth crimes. These are important staple programs that have been cut for thousands of Bronx children. Is there room in the city's budget to fund music and arts programs to keep crime down and help young people achieve in school? Uh, and that goes uh, to start uh, to you, Mr. Weprin. Well, actually, uh, when I was chairman of the Finance Committee of the City Council, uh, I was a major uh, supporter of increasing funding uh, for the arts uh, and our culture uh, in New York City. 
every dollar that was spent uh, on the arts and culture brought back tenfold in economic activity. Uh, you may remember the, uh, the Gates uh, project in Central Park, you know, the, uh, the orange curtains that uh, people were uh, against uh, if the city was going to fund it, and then they found private funding for it. Mayor Bloomberg was pushing for it at the time. Uh, but we really, we probably should have paid for it in seconds. the city because uh, the economic activity that was generated uh, and the, uh, the amount of money we got back uh, tenfold uh, was worth it from an economic point of view. So it made sense. And there's no question we have to uh, increase arts and music uh, in our public schools. And, and I certainly support that. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Mr. Lander, uh, let's talk about uh, the notion of uh, the culture budgets that have been so decimated. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked this question. You know, the creative sector is the soul of our city, um, nourishes our young people and our seniors, and it's also a key driver of our economy. The arts employ nearly 300,000 people, $110 billion of economic output. Um, but this year alone, jobs have shrunk 64% in the pandemic. So we have to do more to invest them. I'm proud to uh, build on some of the programs that uh, David supported when he was in the council. Uh, we support through the Cultural After School Adventures Program, uh, programs all throughout the city. Those support young people after school, but that what they do is the program, the schools hire community-based organizations, and there are so many throughout the Bronx. When I ran the Pratt Center for Community Development, we worked closely uh, with the Point, with Nos Quedamos, with Youth Ministries for Peace and Justice. We need programs that invest in our young people 15. and in the arts in our communities. Thank you very much. Uh, so the next question, uh, the next uh, respondent uh, to that question uh, is uh, to you, Mr. Benjamin. So sure, I agree with all of my colleagues here. You know, I am the senator for Harlem. I represent the Apollo uh, Studio Museum of Harlem, National Black Theater, um, and so many other incredible cultural institutions that are really part of the economic fabric of our of our community. I have a young daughter. I think everything she learns right now is through music. It's through it's through uh, uh, the arts. Uh, this is just how our kids learn. And you know, so many of our so of inspire, aspiring entrepreneurs. They're now looking at things differently now because of technology. People are making things and 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 doing videos off their iPhone, off their iPhones. And so we have, we have to be able to uh, uh, sort of give them the support and the resources that they need. Those are the things that I feel very strongly about. The city council has a role to play, and the control has a role to play. Uh, looking at from if from our perspective, because this, this is not just about arts. Uh, it's also about um, sort of the recovery and coming back out of the, out of the crisis. And so. Arts is going to be very important to that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to you, uh, Mr. Iskall, and uh, the very interesting and uh, important uh, subject of culture budgets. Um, speaking of kids, uh, Senator Benjamin, you probably hear mine screaming in the background. Uh, so, uh, uh, so first off, we can't afford not to. We know that if we don't do it, there are huge costs that we are pushing into the future. Uh, this is something that we've got to stop mortgaging our children's future in the city, and arts uh, is a huge part of that. I think also, um, you know, and, and David Weprin hit on this a bit, uh, and it touches on the other question about small businesses. Um, what does it take to bring the city back? People need to feel safe. They need to have a place to work. 30 seconds. And the city can't be boring. Um, there is decades of economic data that shows if you put an art and cultural institution down in a neighborhood, it irrigates a small, you know, garden of small businesses, restaurants, because of the foot of, of economic growth. So I think this is one of the most important uh, investments the city could be making in terms of our children's future and in terms of the city's recovery. So I don't know how we don't fund it. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Parker. I'm assuming you have something to say about this topic. Yeah, just a little bit, probably 90 <laughs> seconds. Um, so <laughs> look, I, I agree with many of my colleagues, right? That the cultural arts in our city is both a issue of the lifeblood of our city, but also an, a real important economic um, fact around our city. They are they are businesses, right? And so we look at Wall Street that deals with, I'm sorry, we look at Broadway that deals with, you know, like, you know, part of our tourists uh, and the museums and, and so on and so forth. Um, the Brooklyn Museum is is in is in my district. Um, you know, the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens in my district, Prospect Park seconds. is in my district. So all of these institutions are in my district are, and, and are critically important. But we also need to look at small community organizations that are, that are doing a really important work like Makata, um, created by Lori Cumbo, who's a good friend. Um, you know, and, and it, in the support of both those small, those small institutions and particularly community-based Black and Latino, Asian and women institutions, 
um, are going to be also really critical to not just um, bring back the lifeblood, but also employ people and 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 reunite our communities. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, we have come uh, to the end of uh, the questioning in uh, uh, this program. Uh, we do want to mention that uh, Michelle Caruso Cabrera was invited. Uh, she got delayed and was not able to uh, attend this evening's forum. Uh, but right now we have uh, a chance to do closing statements. We're going to extend the time. I know people were rushed on so many of these questions, but we'll give each of you uh, a one minute and 30 seconds, a full 90 seconds uh, to deliver a closing statement. Uh, and so uh, let's start in our same order with you. It'll be uh, Kevin Parker to start. Gary, yeah, thank you very much. And let me begin by thanking the Bronx Democratic County and, and my good friend Jamal Bailey um, for um, putting this opportunity together for us to talk to the people of the Bronx. And again, um, you know, as a state senator from Brooklyn, I think I have a lot in common with the people of the Bronx, having grown up in public housing, having gone to public school, um, and having been somebody who has fought for the issues around equity in our city um, for almost 30 years. Um, I have a background um, you know, of working in government, working with nonprofits, um, you know, places like the city council, the state assembly, worked in the state controller's office, worked on Wall Street. And so um, when I came to the Senate and have been the chair of the Energy and Telecommunications Committee, have been on the finance committee for eight, you know, for 18 years, been on the banking committee, the insurance committee, I've developed the kind of skills and abilities um, that is unique uh, to try to deal with the, the problems that our municipal um, government is going to have. Um, but also have the leadership as having been the whip uh, for over 10 years, over three leaders, and the vision, having worked on the important issues of our city, like you know, creating a, a clean energy economy, seconds. like dealing with um, police reform, like being the sponsor of the state staffing bill, um, and dealing with the issue of, of health care. And so on all the issues that matter, I have both the experience, the leadership, and the vision that it takes to build our city back to progress. Thank you very much, and we appreciate your participation this evening. Uh, David Weprin, uh, your closing statement. You do have 90 seconds, sir. Yes, uh, I too would like to thank uh, Senator Jamal Bailey, uh, Chairman of the uh, Bronx uh, Democratic uh, Committee, uh, as well as all the Bronx Democrats and uh, BronxNet uh, for hosting uh, this very important forum. Uh, I'm running for controller to put the needs of working and middle-class families front and center. Uh, and to protect uh, seniors uh, and their pensions. Uh, like my 90-year-old uh, mother, who is a Cuban Jewish immigrant who came to this country at the age of eight, not speaking a word of English, went to our public schools, went to CUNY, became a teacher, and she has a pension that I'd like to protect. Uh, I also want to help bring us out of the worst fiscal crisis in the history of the city of New York uh, that we've ever experienced. And I think I have the relevant finance background, both public and private sector, to help bringing us out. I chaired the Finance Committee of the City Council for eight years, uh, dealt with two of those recessions uh, during that period of time, seconds. post 9-11 and 2008. Uh, and um, I, I certainly want to help and play a major role in help bringing back uh, the city. Uh, I've got a very diverse set of endorsements uh, uh, from elected officials from all over the city. Uh, and uh, I would like to have the support uh, of Bronx voters uh, and, of course, uh, members of the Bronx uh, Democratic Committee. Uh, and I certainly will Tom. work with all of you uh, in my Bronx office that I will be opening, uh, dealing with financial literacy, dealing with small businesses, Thank and you. dealing with uh, providing banking services and financial services to underserved communities. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Lander, uh, we'll give you uh, 90 seconds for your closing statement. Thank you, Gary and BronxNet. Thank you, uh, Chair Bailey and the Bronx Democrats. It's been an honor to speak to some of the people and issues of the Bronx. I'm proud to have support in the Bronx from uh, Congress Member Jamal Bowman, from State Senator Alessandro Biagi, and as I mentioned, from those Teamsters at Hunts Point Market in Local 202. Before I entered politics, I had a 15-year career running two great community development nonprofit organizations. Uh, at, for 10 years at the Fifth Avenue Committee, I helped bring commercial strips back to life, renovate and build affordable housing. That built on the work of Banana Kelly on Kelly Street in the Bronx, where community development was born from the grassroots energy of the Bronx in a time of crisis. 
at the Pratt Center for Community Development. I work with the communities around the Bronx River to tear down the Sheridan Expressway in portions, to give access to Starlight Park, create new affordable housing and businesses. I've brought that energy of community in the council. Uh, I brought participatory budgeting to New York City, which is now spread all seconds. across the city. Um, what that does is brings people in our community into conversation with each other across lines of difference to imagine a better future. And that's the energy I wanna to bring to the controller's office because if we can build from the energy that renewed the Bronx out of its worst 50. time of crisis, then we can help our city recover from the pandemic, bring it back to life and help us prepare to be far more ready for future crises than we were for this one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Benjamin, uh, your closing statement, sir. Thank you. I want to thank you, Gary. I want to thank the uh, Bronx, and I want to thank the Bronx Democratic Party, led by Chairman Jamal Bailey. Uh, it has been an honor to be here with all of you this evening. Uh, first of all, let me just say, uh, you know, as a son of Harlem, as someone who is the son of immigrant parents, my mother from Guyana and my dad from Jamaica, both of them who work in labor unions, both of them who are retired, uh, protecting their pension is not only uh, important to me, uh, it's also important to so many of us because the, the city of New York is responsible for the pet, the, the, the retiree, the municipal retirees. And, you know, I am someone who attended uh, Brown University. I went to Harvard Business School. I'm the only candidate running in this race who has investment management experience. We're looking at a $240 billion pension fund that needs to be protected and preserved and safeguarded. And I'm the only person running who has that level of experience, which I will bring to bear to protect my parents and protect any retirees and also protect the, New York, the, the city of New York from having to be um, on the hook if we can't afford to pay our bills. And you know, the, the, the comptroller has to hold the city of New York accountable, has to hold the mayor accountable, the city council accountable. We have to look at the NYPD. We need real public safety in the city of New York. And I'm the one candidate who has a mix of experiences, whether it's in the public sector and the private sector, seconds. building affordable housing, uh, 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 and, and all of the, the various uh, things that you need to be a good comptroller. I bring that to the table. So I ask you for your support. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Iskol. Uh, you will get the final, final word uh, and a closing statement. Well, I better not mess it up. Uh, <laughs> Jamal Bailey, thanks for having us today at the Bronx Dems. Uh, Gary, I don't know if you were in the Marine Corps or not, but you run a tight ship. I've done a lot of these forums, as of all of us. This is probably the best, most regimented, uh, buttoned up forum that I've done. So thank you for keeping us on time and on point. Uh, you know, just a couple closing thoughts. Um, you know, number one is is the city stop, has stopped working and it stopped working for us New Yorkers long before COVID. You know, even before COVID, one out of two New Yorkers spent a year in poverty in the last four years. 2019, we had more New Yorkers in homeless shelters at any point in time. Businesses were struggling at razor thin margins. Families were struggling to make ends meet. Uh, that needs to change. Uh, my career, I have a, you know, I'm new to politics, but I'm not new to public service. Uh, I've worked across government, I've worked across business, I've worked across the nonprofit sector. In each of those industries and in each of those capacities for the last 20 years, I have been in positions where I've been holding government accountable, which is the seconds. number one job of Comptroller is to hold this city accountable and make sure it is working on behalf of all New Yorkers. I did it in Iraq. I did it when I came home from Iraq and, the, and our government turned its back on our translators. I ended up testifying before the United States Senate to create an immigrant visa program that's helped 100,000 people immigrate to the United States. I did it when we couldn't get veterans into the VA. I built one of the leading largest providers of mental health care in the United States. I did it at Javits Medical Center, getting 28 federal, state, and city agencies to work together to provide care for New Yorkers in one of their greatest times of need. I have gotten government to do its work, um, both as an outsider and as an insider. I'll do it as comptroller to make sure the city's working for the people of this city. Thank you very much, um, candidates. Um, we appreciate each one of you, uh, Kevin Parker, David Wepkin, uh, Brad Lander, uh, Brian Benjamin, and uh, Zach Iskol. Um, while you might not agree on everything, I know you will agree with me that every, every eligible, eligible voter voters. should vote on June 22nd. Please note that voting can be done by absentee ballot. You can get your ballot and visit vote.nyc, the Democratic primary for controller is June 22nd. Register by May 28th. We can request an absentee ballot May 23rd to June 15th. Mail-in and absentee ballots must be postmarked by uh, the primary day, June 22nd. And of course, the general election is November 2nd. We thank our collaborators, the Bronx County Democratic Committee, and uh, we thank you for watching. Please make sure you go out and vote on June 22nd. 
We'll see you next week. Good night.